8th of November, Year of the Depend Adult Undergarment, Interdependence Day, Guadamus Igata. Boston AA is like AA nowhere else on this planet. Just like AA every place else, Boston AA is divided into numerous individual AA groups, and each group has its particular group name, like the Reality Group, or the Alston Group, or the Clean and Sober Group, and each group holds its regular meetings once a week. But almost all Boston Group's meetings are speaker meetings. That means that at the meetings there are recovering alcoholic speakers who stand up in front of everybody at an amplified podium and share their experience, strength and hope. And the singular thing is that these speakers are not even members of the group that's holding the meeting in Boston. The speakers at one certain group's weekly speaker meeting are always from some other certain Boston AA group. The people from the other group who are here at, like, your group speaking are here on something called a commitment. Commitments are where some members of one group commit to hit the road and travel to another group's meeting to speak publicly from the podium. Then a bunch of people from the host group hit the opposite lane of the same road on some other night and go to the visiting group's meeting to speak. Groups always trade commitments. You come speak to us and we'll come speak to you. It can seem bizarre. You always go elsewhere to speak. At your own group's meeting, you are a host. You just sit there and you listen as hard as you can, and you make coffee and 60 cup urns and stack polystyrene cups in big ziggurats and sell raffle tickets and make sandwiches, and you empty ashtrays and scrub out urns and sweep floors when the other group speakers are through. You never share your experience, strength and hope on stage behind a fiberboard podium with its cheap, non-digital PA systems mic except in front of some other Metro Boston group. Every night in Boston, bumper-stickered cars full of totally sober people, wall-eyed from caffeine and trying to read illegibly scrawled directions by the dashboard lights crisscross the city, heading for the church basements or bingo halls or nursing home cafeterias of other AA groups to put on commitments. Being an active member of a Boston AA group is probably a little bit like being a serious musician or like athlete in terms of constant travel. The White Flag Group of Enfield, Massachusetts, in metropolitan Boston, meets Sundays in the cafeteria of the Provident Nursing Home on Hanneman Street, off Commonwealth Avenue, a couple blocks west of Enfield Tennis Academy's flat-topped hill. Tonight, the White Flag Group is hosting a commitment from the Advanced Basics Group of Concord, a suburb of Boston. The Advanced Basics people have driven almost an hour to get here, plus there's always the problem of signless urban streets and directions given over the phone. On this coming Friday night, a small horde of white flaggers will drive out to Concord to put on a reciprocal commitment for the Advanced Basics Group, travelling long distances on signless streets trying to pass directions like take the second left off the rotary by the driveway to the chiropractors and getting lost and shooting your whole evening after a long day just to speak for like six minutes at a plywood podium is called getting active with your group. The speaking itself is known as 12th step work or giving it away. Giving it away is a cardinal Boston AA principle. The term's derived from an epigrammatic description of recovery in Boston AA. You give it up to get it back to give it away. Sobriety in Boston is regarded as less a gift than a sort of cosmic loan. You can't pay the loan back, but you can pay it forward by spreading the message that despite all appearances, AA works. Spreading this message to the next new guy who's tottered into a meeting and is sitting in the back row, unable to hold his cup of coffee. The only way to hang on to sobriety is to give it away, and even just 24 hours of sobriety is worth doing anything for, a sober day being nothing short of a daily miracle if you've got the disease like he's got the disease, says the Advanced Basic member who's chairing this evening's commitment, saying just a couple of public words to the hall before he opens the meeting and retires to a stool next to the podium and calls his group speakers by random lot. The chairperson says he didn't used to be able to go 24 lousy minutes without a nip before he came in. Coming in means admitting that your personal ass is kicked and tottering into Boston AA ready to go to any lengths to stop the shitstorm. The Advanced Basics chairperson looks like a perfect cross between pictures of Dick Cavett and Truman Capote, except this guy's also like totally, almost flamboyantly bald, and to top it off, he's wearing a bright black country western shirt with baroque curlicues of white nody piping across the chest and shoulders, and a string tie, plus sharp-toed boots of some sort of weirdly imbricate reptile skin, and overall he's riveting to look at, grotesque in that riveting way that flaunts its grotesquery. There are more cheap metal ashtrays and styrofoam cups in this broad hall than you'll see anywhere else ever on earth. Gately's sitting right up front in the first row. 
So close to the podium, he can see the tailor's notch in the chairperson's outsized incisors. But he enjoys twisting around and watching everybody come in and mill around, shaking water off their outerwear, trying to find empty seats. Even on the night of the I-Day holiday, the Providence cafeteria is packed by 20 hundred hours. AA does not take holidays any more than the disease does. This is the big established Sunday PM meeting for AAs in Enfield and Alston and Brighton. Regulars come every week from Watertown and East Newton too, often, unless they're out on commitments with their own groups. The Provident cafeteria walls, painted and indecisive green, are tonight bedecked with portable felt banners emblazoned with AA slogans in Cub Scoutish blue and gold. The slogans on them appear way too insipid even to mention what they are, e.g. one day at a time for one. The effete western dressed guy concludes his opening exhortation, leads the opening moment of silence, reads the AA preamble, pulls a random name out of the crested butte cowboy hat he's holding, makes a squinty show of reading it, says he'd like to call Advanced Basics first random speaker of the evening, and asks if his fellow group member John L is in the house here tonight. John L gets up to the podium and says, That is a question I did not used to be able to answer. This gets a laugh, and everybody's posture gets subtly more relaxed, because it's clear that John L has some sober time in, and isn't going to be one of those AA speakers who's so racked with self-conscious nerves he makes the empathetic audience nervous too. Everybody in the audience is aiming for total empathy with the speaker. That way they'll be able to receive the AA message he's here to carry. Empathy, in Boston AA, is called identification. Then John L says his first name and what he is, and everybody calls hello. White Flag is one of the area AA meetings Ennett House requires its residents to attend. You have to be seen at a designated AA or NA meeting every single night of the week or out you go, discharged. A house staff member has to accompany the residents when they go to the designated meetings so they can be officially seen there. The residents' house councillors suggest that they sit right up at the front of the hall where they can see the pores of the speaker's nose and try to identify instead of compare. Again, identify means empathise. Identifying, unless you've got a stake in comparing, isn't very hard to do here. Because if you sit up front and listen hard, all the speaker's stories of decline and fall and surrender are basically alike, and like your own. Fun with the substance, then very gradually less fun, then significantly less fun because of like blackouts you suddenly come out of on the highway going 145 kilometres an hour with companions you do not know. Nights you awake from in unfamiliar bedding next to someone who doesn't even resemble any known sort of mammal. Three-day blackouts you come out of and have to buy a newspaper to even know what town you're in. Yes, gradually less and less actual fun, but with some physical need for the substance now, instead of the former voluntary fun. Then, at some point, suddenly, just very little fun at all, combined with a terrible, daily, hand-trembling need, then dread, anxiety, irrational phobias, dim, siren-like memories of fun, trouble with assorted authorities, knee-buckling headaches, mild seizures, and the litany of what Boston AA calls losses. Then come the day I lost my job to drinking. Concord's John L has a huge hanging gut, and just no ass at all the way some big older guys' asses seem to get sucked into their body and reappear out front as gut. Gately, in sobriety, does nightly sit-ups out of fear this will all of a sudden happen to him as age 30 approaches. Gately is so huge no one sits behind him for several rows. John L has the biggest bunch of keys Gately's ever seen. They're on one of those pull-outable wire janitor's keychains that clips to the belt loop, and the speaker jangles them absently, unaware his one tip of the hat to public nerves. He's also wearing grey janitor's pants. Lost well, my damn job, he says. I mean to say, I still knew where it was and whatnot. I just went in as usual one day and there was some other fellow doing it. Which gets another laugh. Then more losses, with the substance seeming like the only consolation against the pain of mounting losses. And of course, you're in denial about it being the substance that's causing the very losses it's consoling you about. Alcohol destroys slowly but thoroughly is what a fellow said to me the first night I come in, up in Concord, and that fellow ended up becoming my sponsor. Then less mild seizures, DTs during attempts to taper off too fast, introduction to subjective bugs and rodents, then one more binge and more formicative bugs, then eventually a terrible acknowledgement that some line has undeniably been crossed, and fist at the sky as God is my witness vows to buckle down and lick this thing for good, to quit for all time, then maybe a few white-knuckled days of initial success, then a slip, then more pledges, clock-watching, baroque self-regulations, repeated slips back into the substance's relief after like two days' abstinence, 
ghastly hangovers, head-flattening guilt and self-disgust, superstructures of additional self-regulations, e.g. not before 0900, not on a work night, only when the moon is waxing, only in the company of Swedes, which also fail. When I was drunk, I wanted to get sober, and when I was sober, I wanted to get drunk, John L. says. I lived that way for years, and I submit to you that's not living, that's a fucking death in life. Then unbelievable psychic pain, a kind of peritonitis of the soul, psychic agony, fear of impending insanity, why can't I quit if I want to quit, unless I'm insane. Appearances at hospital detoxes and rehabs, domestic strife, financial freefall, eventual domestic losses. And then I'll ask my wife to drink in. I mean, I still knew where she was and whatnot. I just went in one day and there was some other fella doing it. At which there was not much laughter. Lots of pained nods. It's often the same all over in terms of domestic losses. Then vocational ultimatums, unemployability, financial ruin, pancreatitis, overwhelming guilt, bloody vomiting, cirrhotic neuralgia, incontinence, neuropathy, nephritis, black depressions, searing pain with a substance affording increasingly brief periods of relief. Then, finally, no relief available anywhere at all. Finally, it's impossible to get high enough to freeze what you feel like, being this way, and now you hate the substance, hate it but you still find yourself unable to stop doing it, the substance. You find you finally want to stop more than anything on earth, and it's no fun doing it anymore, and you can't believe you ever liked doing it, And but you still can't stop. It's like you're totally fucking bats. It's like there's two yous. And when you'd sell your own dear mum to stop and still you find you can't stop, then the last layer of jolly friendly mask comes off your old friend the substance. It's midnight now, and all masks come off. And you all of a sudden see the substance as it really is. For the first time you see the disease as it really is. Really has been all this time. You look in the mirror at midnight and see what owns you. What's become what you are. A fucking living death. I tell you it's not near being alive. And by the end I was undead, not alive. And I tell you the idea of dying was nothing compared to the idea of living like that for another five or ten years and only then dying. With audience heads nodding in rows like a windswept meadow, boy can they ever identify. And then you're in serious trouble, very serious trouble, and you know it, finally, deadly serious trouble, because this substance that you thought was your one true friend, that you gave up all for, gladly, that for so long gave you relief from the pain of the losses your love of that relief caused, your mother and lover and god and compadre has finally removed its smiley face mask to reveal centerless eyes and a ravening maw and canines down to here, its face in the floor, the grinning, root-white face of your worst nightmares, and the face is your own face in the mirror. Now, it's you. The substance has devoured or replaced and become you, and the puke, drool, and substance-crusted t-shirt you've both worn for weeks now gets torn off, and you stand there looking, and in the root-white chest where your heart, given away to it, should be beating, in its exposed chest centre and centreless eyes, is just a lightless hole, more teeth, and a beckoning, taloned hand dangling something irresistible. And now you see you've been had, screwed royal, stripped and fucked and tossed to the side like some stuffed toy to lie for all time in the posture you land in. You see now that it's your enemy, and your worst personal nightmare, and the trouble it's gotten you into is undeniable and still you can't stop. Doing the substance now is like attending black mass, but you still can't stop, even though the substance no longer gets you high. You are, as they say, finished. You cannot get drunk, and you cannot get sober, you cannot get high, and you cannot get straight. You are behind bars. You are in a cage and can see only bars in every direction. You are in the kind of a hell of a mess that either ends lives or turns them around. You are at a fork in the road that Boston AA calls your bottom. Though the term is misleading, because everybody here agrees it's more like someplace very high and unsupported. You're on the edge of something tall and leaning way out forward. If you listen for the similarities, all these speakers' substance careers seem to terminate at the same cliff's edge. You are now finished as a substance user. It's the jumping off place. You now have two choices. You can either eliminate your own map for keeps, blades are the best, or else pills, or well, there's always quietly sucking off the exhaust pipe of your repossessable car in the bank-owned garage of your familyless home. Something whimpery instead of banging, better clean and quiet, and, since your whole career's been one long futile flight from pain, painless. 
Though of the alcoholics and drug addicts who compose over 70% of a given year's suicides, some try to go out with a last, great garish balaclavan gesture. One long-time member of the White Flag Group is a prognathous lady named Louise B., who tried to take a map-eliminating dive off the old Hancock building downtown in BS81, but got caught in the gust of a rising thermal only six flights off the roof and got blown cartwheeling back up and in through the smoke glass window of an arbitrage firm suite on the 34th floor, ending up sprawled prone on a high-gloss conference table with only lacerations and a compound of the collarbone and an experience of willed self-annihilation and external intervention that has left her rabidly Christian, rabidly as in foam, so that she's comparatively ignored and avoided, though her AA story being just like everybody else's but more spectacular has become Metro Boston AA myth. But so when you get to this jumping off place at the finish of your substance career, you can either take up the Luger or Blade and eliminate your own personal map. This can be at age 60 or 27 or 17. Or you can get out the very beginning of the yellow pages or internet psych service file and make a blubbering 0200 hours phone call and admit to a gentle, grandparentish voice that you're in trouble. Deadly, serious trouble. And the voice will try to soothe you into hanging on until a couple of hours go by and two pleasantly earnest, weirdly calm guys in conservative attire appear smiling at your door sometime before dawn and speak quietly to you for hours and leave you not remembering anything from what they said except the sense that they used to be eerily like you, just where you are, utterly fucked. And but now somehow aren't anymore fucked like you, at least they didn't seem like they were unless the whole thing's some incredibly involved scam, this AA thing. And so, but anyway, you sit there on what's left of your furniture in the lavender dawn light and realise that by now you literally have no other choices beside trying this AA thing or else eliminating your map. So you spend the day killing every last bit of every substance you've got in one last joyless, bitter farewell binge and resolve the next day to go ahead and swallow your pride, and maybe your common sense too, and try these meetings of this program that at best is probably just Unitarian happy horse shit, and at worst is a cover for some glazed and canny cult type thing where they'll keep you sober by making you spend 20 hours a day selling cellophane cones of artificial flowers on the median strips of heavy flow roads. And what defines this cliffish nexus of exactly two total choices, this miserable road fork Boston AA calls your bottom, is that at this point you feel like maybe selling flowers on median strips might not be so bad, not compared to what you've got going personally at this juncture. And this, at root, is what unites Boston AA. It turns out this same resigned, miserable, brainwash and exploit me if that's what it takes type desperation has been the jumping off place for just about every AA you meet it emerges once you've actually gotten it up to stop darting in and out of the big meetings and start walking up with your wet hand out and trying to actually personally meet some Boston AAs. As the one personally tough old guy or lady you're always particularly scared of and drawn to says... Nobody ever comes in because things were going really well and they just wanted to round out their PM social calendar. Everybody but everybody comes in dead-eyed and puke-white and with their face hanging down around their knees and with a well-thumbed firearm and ordnance mail-order catalogue kept safe and available at home, map-wise, for when this last desperate resort of hugs and clichés turns out to be just happy horseshit for you. You are not unique, they'll say. This initial hopelessness unites every soul in this broad, cold, salad-barred hall. They are like Hindenburg survivors. Every meeting is a reunion once you've been in for a while. And then the palsied newcomers who totter in desperate and miserable enough to hang in and keep coming and start feebly to scratch beneath the unlikely insipid surface of the thing Don Gately's found, then get united by a second common experience. The shocking discovery that the thing actually does seem to work does keep you substance free. It's improbable and shocking. When Gately finally snapped to the fact, one day about four months into his Ennett House residency, that quite a few days seemed to have gone by without his playing with the usual idea of slipping over to Unit 7 and getting loaded in some non-uremic way the courts couldn't prove, that several days had gone by without his even thinking of oral narcotics or a tightly rolled Dubois or a cold foamer on a hot day. When he realised that the various substances he didn't used to be able to go a day without absorbing hadn't even, like, occurred to him in almost a week, Gately hadn't felt so much grateful or joyful as just plain shocked. The idea that AA might actually somehow work unnerved him. He suspected some sort of trap, 
some new sort of trap. At this stage, he and the other Ennit residents who were still there and starting to snap to the fact that AA might work began to sit around together late at night going batshit together because it seemed to be impossible to figure out just how AA worked. It did, yes, tentatively seem maybe actually to be working, but Gately couldn't for the life of him figure out how, just sitting on hemorrhoid hostile folding chairs every night, looking at nose pores and listening to cliches could work. Nobody's ever been able to figure AA out. It's another binding commonality. And the folks with serious time in AA are infuriating about questions starting with how. You ask the scary old guys how AA works, and they smile their chilly smiles and say, just fine, it works is all, end of story. The newcomers who abandon common sense and resolve to hang in and keep coming, and then find their cages all of a sudden open mysteriously after a while, share this sense of deep shock and possible trap. About newer Boston AAs with like six months clean, you can see this look of glazed suspicion instead of beatific glee. An expression like that of bug-eyed natives confronted suddenly with a Zippo lighter. And so this unites them, nervously. This tentative assemblage of possible glimmers of something like hope. This grudging move towards maybe acknowledging that this unromantic, unhip, cliched AA thing, so unlikely and uncompromising, so much the inverse of what they'd come too much to love, might really be able to keep the lover's toothy maw at bay. The process is the neat reverse of what brought you down and in here. Substances start out being so magically great, so much the interior jigsaw's missing piece, that at the start you just know, deep in your gut, that they'll never let you down. You just know it, but they do. And then this goofy slapdash anarchic system of low rent gatherings and corny slogans and saccharine grins and hideous coffee is so lame you just know there's no way it could ever possibly work except for the utterest morons. And then Gately seems to find out AA turns out to be the very loyal friend he thought he'd had and then lost when you came in. And so you hang in and stay sober and straight and out of sheer hand-burned on hot stove terror, you heed the improbable sounding warnings not to stop pounding out the nightly meetings, even after the substance cravings have left, and you feel like you've got a grip on the thing at last and can now go it alone, you still don't try to go it alone. You heed the improbable warnings, because by now, you have no faith in your own sense of what's really improbable and what isn't, since AA seems, improbably enough, to be working, and with no faith in your own senses, you're confused, flummoxed, and when people with AA time strongly advise you to keep coming, you nod robotically and keep coming. And you sweep floors and scrub out ashtrays and fill stained steel urns with hideous coffee. And you keep getting ritually down on your big knees every morning and night, asking for help from a sky that still seems a burnished shield against all who would ask aid of it. How can you pray to a god you believe only morons believe in still? But the old guys say it doesn't yet matter what you believe or don't believe. Just do it, they say. And like a shock-trained organism, without any kind of independent human will, you do exactly like you're told. You keep coming and coming, nightly. And now you take pains not to get booted out of the squalid halfway house you'd at first tried so hard to get discharged from. You hang in and hang in, meeting after meeting, warm day after cold day. And not only does the urge to get high stay more or less away, but more general life-quality type things... Just as improbably promised at first when you'd come in, things seem to get progressively somehow better inside for a while, then worse, then even better. Then for a while worse in a way that's still somehow better, realer. You feel weirdly unblinded, which is good, even though a lot of the things you now see about yourself and how you've lived are horrible to have to see. And by this time the whole thing is so improbable and unpassable that you're so flummoxed you're convinced you're maybe brain damaged still at this point from all the years of substances, and you figure you'd better hang in at this Boston AA, where older guys who seem to be less damaged, or at least less flummoxed by their damage, will tell you in terse, simple, imperative clauses exactly what to do, and where and when to do it, though never the how or why. And at this point, you've started to have an almost classic sort of blind faith in the older guys. A blind faith in them not born of zealotry or even belief, but just of a chilled conviction that you have no faith whatsoever left in yourself. And now if the older guys say jump, you ask them to hold their hand at the desired height, and now they've got you. And you're free. <laughs>